we're talking tonight uh, about policing black power, and we're going to use the New Bethel incident as a focal point to discuss that. So I'll do a little bit of introduction to the black power movement, uh, although not very heavily. I'll talk again to remind us about the New Bethel incident, all right, and get you sort of situated in that. Uh, and then we'll use the New Bethel incident to pivot into thinking about policing black power from a community or streets perspective, and we'll introduce Dan Aldridge to do that. And then what it meant in the courts, right? And how does that movement forward look uh, in terms of the role of courts and, and lawyers in this critical part of Detroit's history? Uh, and Elliot Hall will help us with that, right? Uh, we're gonna ask them to keep their presentations to about 20 minutes, although I've always told them when I have elders in the house, I never tell anybody uh, when to stop. Uh, but we also want to maintain time for questions, all right? Because an important part of our design here uh, is that you can ask questions, we collectively can engage in discussions, uh, and you can direct some of those questions and issues to our, our speakers and, and be learning uh, different aspects of, of how they would respond to issues that are of concern to you. All right, so this is intended to just be evocative, right? To get you in the mindset of the 1950s, 1960s with Malcolm X, to be thinking about some of the icons of the black power movement uh, and certainly you do have Malcolm, you have Stokely Carmichael. If you're thinking about specifically the Black Panthers, uh, this is Huey Newton's biography. Um, and one of the ironies, if we're talking about policing black power, the only reason that Purnell Joseph was able to write so successfully, Waiting Till the Midnight Hour, a narrative history of black power in America, is guess who attended all of the black power meetings? Guess who attended all of the black power meetings? The police, right, and specifically FBI informants, right, and then they wrote reports. So a wonderful thing called the Freedom of Information Act has allowed us to have an incredibly detailed history of a movement that was largely secret, right, and clandestine uh, because they were being policed, right, and again, for to think about policing black power, and, and it's not just a metaphor uh, in this uh, instance or scenario. But then again, so many interesting things happen in Detroit. Right? So the birth of the Republic of New Africa, which you'll hear more about later, happened in Detroit. Right? Uh, and the lawyer whose picture you see on the, the screen, Milton Henry, uh, a graduate of Yale Law School, uh, was one of the founders and was elected president of the Republic of New Africa. The book that you see on the other part of the slide is called How Social Movements Die. Right? So How Social Movements Die and it's a history of the efforts to repress and destroy the Republic of New Africa, right? So they were consciously targeted by multiple levels of policing, uh, leading uh, uh, or contributing uh, to their demise, right? So we've got the Republic of New Africa. They're founded in March of, two, uh, of 1968, coming out of the wake of the rebellion of 1967. Uh, and they're going to hold their first anniversary meetings at the New Bethel Church. Right? And now we're moving into 1969, Mark's coming up on the, the 50th anniversary of that event, uh, and we're moving to the New Bethel incident. Right? So who are the actors? Right? Well, you've got the Republic of New Africa, uh, you've got Milton Henry, you've got Reverend C.L. Franklin, who we've talked about before, uh, who's the, 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 the pastor of the New Bethel Church, uh, you've got the Wayne County Prosecutor, uh, you've got the Detroit Police Officers Association and the Detroit Police Force, you have a figure that we've mentioned, but I want to talk a little bit more in a minute, uh, a gentleman named Judge George Crockett, Jr. And Judge Crockett's going to play a pivotal role in the New Bethel incident, uh, and we've got to introduce him so you can learn more about, again, the history coming out of Detroit. Uh, you've got the Black United Front, uh, which was one of the responses to the New Bethel incident, uni uniting uh, an incredibly diverse array uh, of the black community in Detroit. Uh, and the gentleman over there, Dan Aldridge, was the founder of that movement, right? So we're getting first-person history that you're going to hear this evening. Uh, and you've got amazing community lawyering that starts at this time, uh, in part in response to having black judges, right? So you've got people on the bench that will finally listen to you and give you a chance, and that opens up the chance for some incredible lawyering. One of those lawyers is over here, Elliot Hall. Uh, another name that we've mentioned before that should be in your ears uh, is Ken Cockrell, Sr., Right, and kind of think about uh, the lawyering and the importance of, of Ken Cockrell Sr. To, to these stories. So the incident, right, first anniversary, they're meeting at the New Bethel Church. Uh, certain members of the Republic of New Africa are armed, right, and are at the outside of the church, and a patrol car comes by, right, and you have an incident. And there's all sorts of, of, uh, of stories told on different sides about what caused the incident or what the, the sources of are. 
But at the end of it, two police officers are shot, right? One of those police officers is killed, uh, and they call for backup, right? Uh, and that's when all hell breaks loose, right? And the police storm the church, right, with men, women, and children inside that facility shooting it up, right? Uh, they uh, shoot four members of the Republic of New Africa as part of this attack. Uh, uh, amazingly, nobody is killed inside of the church, right? And then the police arrest everyone who's in the church, right? Uh, 142 people, men, women, and children, uh, and then they're taken down to the first precinct uh, in a mass arrest, right? Uh, so we're going to take an aside now. So you've got all that drama. All of them are sitting down at the church, and I want to talk a little bit about Judge George Crockett. Right? Uh, Judge Crockett was born in Florida in 1909. Uh, and I'm working with a, an amazing emeritus professor at Wayne State Law School, Edward Littlejohn, uh, and working with Ed to complete a biography of Judge George Crockett. So, so my mind's very sort of, of, of into Judge Crockett. And, and I'd love to hear some of the opinions of some of the other folks here. Uh, I think one of the things that made the judge special, right, is that he was still living in an era where there were giants of black reconstruction uh, that were still around and still part of the living memory. Uh, and that's not true for subsequent generations, right? So I think one of the things that inspired him uh, was the fact that he had living heroes in memory uh, from Black Reconstruction that were influencing uh, what he thought of himself, what he thought of, of, of the community. Had an amazing education, Stanton High School in Jacksonville, Morehouse College, so a Morehouse man, and, and, and some people in this room should know what that means. Uh, and then somehow ends up uh, in Michigan from Florida uh, in the very cold winters and graduates from the University of Michigan Law School in uh, 1934, one of the first uh, numbers of, of black students to become lawyers from the University of Michigan. He goes off and has an amazing career first, right? He was the first black lawyer at the United States Department of Labor. Uh, he was the first black investigator for the Fair Employment Practices Commission. Uh, he played a very important role in the uh, auto workers union, the UAW, uh, until he was part of the portion of the union that was purged by Walter Ruther. Right? We see the nice Walter Ruther on the Ruther Library. Uh, there's some not so nice scenes and histories back there. Uh, and Maurice Sugar and Ernie Goodman and, and Judge Crockett were part of a purge, uh, kicking them out of senior positions in the UAW. Uh, he was the founder of one of the first integrated law firms in the nation, uh, Goodman, Crockett, Eden, and Robb. Uh, we heard about the Robert Mosley case uh, last week with Jermon Jordan, a young uh, black teenager who was shot in the back, uh, allegedly uh, stealing a car. Uh, Crockett and Goodman uh, did some amazing lawyering to get a, a, a coroner's inquest turned really into an effort for a trial uh, and try to get justice in that case. Right? None of you will know the Battle of Foley Square if you're not uh, of, of over 50 or 60, but it was one of the most important trials of the last century's century uh, where the United States arrested the entire leadership uh, of the U.S. Communist Party. Right? And Judge George Crockett played a critical role in their defense, the only African-American member of the defense team. Uh, and to uh, be uh, rewarded for his service, uh, the judge sentenced all of the defense lawyers to, to, to prison uh, on contempt of court. Right? Uh, so you see that he actually had to stand up for his principles uh, in ways that were very unexpected. Uh, 1960s, he was leading the NLG's efforts of Mississippi Summer uh, down in the, the Civil Rights Movement in the South. Uh, and then he wants to run uh, for Recorder's Court coming back to Detroit. So 1966, he runs for Recorder's Court. Uh, he was an early leading candidate. Uh, and then the knives come out. And the knives come out from the left and the right. Uh, the Walter Ruther wing and the UAW are trying to, to undermine his campaign very publicly. Uh, the J. Edgar Hoover, you can find, uh, again, policing black power, and black power has different meanings, right? People of black authority entering uh, uh, the establishment power were policed as well. Uh, and uh, J. Edgar Hoover is, is actually writing memos saying they've got to undermine George Crockett's campaign, right? And so they have some really crazy right-wing stuff going on at the same time. Uh, doesn't work. He has great connections to the community. Uh, he's one of the greatest vote getters. And he starts his judicial career on January 1st, uh, 1967. Right? Uh, and he is one of the leading constitutional scholars in the country. That's his background. Uh, and he takes the new developments of the constitutional law seriously. And that means starting to put limits on uh, police practices. And he does that from his very first days on the bench. Uh, we all know what happens in July 1967, right? That is what? We've got the rebellions, 
right? And the prosecutor is saying every single person, these are mass arrests, should be subject to a $10,000 bond, which is really basically saying all the black people arrested are not going to be able to get probation. And the only judge on recorder's court that pushed back on that and treated that as just a normal probation uh, question or bond question uh, was Judge Crockett, right? And he got a lot of backlash for that. Uh, 1968, he actually was the judge who was, was presiding over the quote-unquote trial of the person who started the rebellion. Uh, and he has these wonderful sort of, of comments how the real cause of the rebellion was inappropriate police practices, right? And uh, the person who's allegedly charged, he says you can only be charged with a misdemeanor, not a felony, uh, and that case disappears. So they're out to get him. And one evidence of that is in early 1968, or 1969, uh, there's already media storms over every single case he does, right? He had one case where he said that uh, addiction should be treated as a public health issue, uh, and somebody who was convicted of a crime that had addiction should get uh, rehabilitation, not prison, right? Uh, same case, they had beat the individual, and the, courts, uh, the judge said, uh, if the police have beat you, that's your punishment. Right? I'm not going to send anybody who's beaten by the police to prison because you've already been punished by the state. Right? Uh, so there were calls for his impeachment uh, at, uh, uh, as early as February, March 1969, and then you have the New Bethel incident. Right? And that's just putting uh, uh, an accelerant on a fire, uh, and they're going to make sure they get rid of Judge Crockett. Right? And they've wanted to get him before, uh, and the things I'll describe now are what he did that day uh, that led to, again, a huge backlash against the judge. So, continuing our narrative of the New Bethel Institute, C.L. Franklin and State Representative Jimmy Del Rio knock on Judge Crockett's door at 5 a.m. in the morning, right? Wake him up and tell him what happened in terms of the mass arrest, right? Uh, and he happened to be fortuitously the presiding judge who was supposed to be hearing motions if motions came, right? Uh, by 6.40 a.m., right, almost an hour and a half later, He's down at the first precinct, and he's telling them, I'm going to start holding court. Right? And he makes them bring the people out who were arrested and says, show cause. If you can't show cause while you're detaining this person, I'm setting them free. Right? Some skirmishes back and forth. He holds the prosecutor in contempt uh, for rearresting somebody that he had released. Uh, they reconvene in a more formal proceeding starting at 12 noon and they proceed to arrest 139 persons who had been subject to the mass arrest that very day with the prosecutor's uh, consent. Right? And then there were seven people that were more controversial. They had nitrate tests, which allegedly uh, has some detection of, of, of gunpowder, but they're incredibly questionable, uh, and the judge invalidates those tests and lets those seven people free. And what you would imagine, if a black power group kills a police officer, that's going to be the headline. Right? No. The headline becomes, Black Judge, Judge George Crockett, frees people of a mass arrest. Uh, and there really is, subsequent, and we'll let the, the, the first person witnesses fill in the details, uh, all hell breaks loose again. There's media firestorms, there's huge police protests, uh, the governor, the mayor, uh, 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 resolutions in the state house and senate are being passed calling for him to be removed from office uh, and then there's a long legal battle internally trying to uh, fight off the impeachment efforts of, of Judge Crockett. Right? Uh, and I love this picture, right? So you see Judge Crockett down at the First Circuit that very day, right? Uh, always stately, right? Uh, an amazing reserved demeanor uh, uh, despite the sort of amazing courage and, and, and character that he has. Uh, and then again, we have the backlash. So that sets the stage, right? Uh, and I'm going to pass the, the, the baton next to Dan Aldridge to sort of talk about what was the reaction on the streets. And, and, and Dan uh, has a huge history, so I'm not going to combine you to anything. You talk about anything you want that's being triggered by this. Uh, and then we'll pass the baton uh, over to, to Elliot Hall. Uh, and uh, just a little bit more about these gentlemen, as you heard from our talk before, Dan Aldridge, amongst many other things, uh, was one of the leading forces behind the People's Tribunal to try the police officers in the Algiers Motel incident, right? Uh, so been involved in the community, deeply involved in the community, uh, and it's not surprising then that he's taking the lead in establishing uh, the Black United Front, right? Uh, but that's just a very short uh, a list of, of the many amazing things that Dan has done. Uh, and then Elliot was a uh, graduate of Wayne State Law School, which I'm going to give a shout out to and very proud, uh, class of 1965. Uh, as early as 1971, was defending people in the Black Panther Party in Detroit. 
uh, and in 1974 was appointed by Mayor Young to be uh, Corporation Counsel, which is the top lawyer for the city and the first African American to hold that position. Uh, and, and, and Elliot has had just a, an amazing career that goes uh, from his graduation onward, but we're going to try to get him to talk about that era of criminal defense work and how important that was uh, in this context. So, a uh, big round of applause for Dan Aldrich. Let me correct, uh, Peter, two things Excellent. you said. Number one, uh, Milton Henry was not the president okay. of the Republic of New Africa. Number two, Reverend C.O. Franklin was not at New Bethel. Okay. I was at New Bethel that night. Right. Um, it's interesting that when we had these rallies at the time, all of the black power groups would come and get together. It was an event called by the Republic of New Africa. What was interesting is that I was scheduled to be the first president of the Republic of New Africa. They pulled together small groups from all around the country, and they had a large group that came in from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, they were part, led by a guy named Harley L. Jones, they were part of a group connected with Ahmed Evans. If you know that case, that's where he was, uh, I guess, charged with trying to sh be a sniper police. Somehow, in all the, that time, there was a magazine put out in Detroit called Score Magazine. That magazine was put out by a fellow named Lou Gordon. He both had a magazine and he had a, uh, a, a television show on Channel 50. He came to the conclusion that I was the most dangerous person in Detroit. That was his, however he came to that conclusion. The result was that the police were then, I, my status obviously went up with them. Uh, prior to that time, I was involved with the police because they killed a young man, he was named Chucky Howell. He was 13 years old, he was the size of a nine year old. He had one eye and he, he limped on one leg. He was virtually crippled, and they shot him, and two police, both of over 6'2", claimed that they, their lives were in jeopardy. I got involved in the case, exposed them, uh, in fact, even wrote a, a grant and founded something called the Chucky Howe Health Center that was funded by a federal grant. And it, was, it, was a, it was stationed over at Buckville Middle School, and uh, that did not make me popular with them again. Uh, and so the police were, at some point, I was on their radar. During New Bethel, what happened at New Bethel, I was at New Bethel. I was there with Mark Bethune, who many of you may know involved in the case of Brown, Boyd, and Bethune. Mark, there were lots of uh, uh, very attractive women there that, that, that evening. And um, I was seeing what was happening there. So I was the older guy. So I said, hey, let's go. I don't like what's going on here. The reason is the guys from Republic of Africa were dressed in military uniforms and epithets you know, on the shoulder. I saw these, and they had carrying around rifles. One guy whose name was Rafael Vieira, Puerto Rican guy from New York who joined the group. I saw him go in whatever it was parade rest, and he stepped inside of the M1 in the sling, and the sling hit the ground. I said, no, I'm out of here. It's time to go. These guys got these guns. They don't know what they're doing. They also were raising money at the time, and one time they were raising money, uh, the guys from Cleveland would put dollar money on their foreheads and said, uh, who can match this? And one guy had a big turban on, and he took the turban off, and he had a Marcel wave, you know. I said, what in the world is this? So I tried to get Bethune, Victor Stewart, and the other guys who were there with me, who all members of my group was called Bob Poole, the all African People's Union, said, let's get out of here. So they wouldn't move. So I said, well, that's okay, I'm gone. By the time I get to the house, my wife says, look, you gotta get back to New Bethel. I said, what's wrong? So you're surrounded and the, the, the police are shooting at them, 
and Ebo, which is, that was Mark Bethune's nickname, he called and said he's going to go somewhere and hide up under the porch. So I said, where's a certain person you guys know now? Kenny. Some of you know Kenny Snog. I said, where's Kenny? Because they were close. So I said, wherever, wherever Kenny was, if he think Mark's in trouble, he's on his way there. So I ran his house. I caught him running down the street on Monterey near Dexter with a rifle. Now I knocked him down. He says, man, I'm, I got to do it. No, no. I said, you're going to go in the house. You're going to put that gun up. And you, we're going back down. You and I are going back and observe what's happening. And so then he and I went back to observe, to observe the situation. Um, so I was in Bethel up until the time I left right before the shooting because as soon as I hit the house, my wife was young, Dan, they're on the phone. They tell me they're shooting, they're shooting, they're shooting. And so that was, um, so that's how I knew Reverend Franklin was not there because I was physically that day. And I al always tried to discourage people from doing um, things that I thought were uh, dangerous and, did, and really didn't make much sense to me. Uh, so that was New Bethel. Um, the Algiers Motel case, um, my wife, it was is related, so related to Carl Cooper, one of the boys who was killed. They're not really related, but you know that they, they caught they've been calling themselves family for 30 years. So that morning she gets a phone call from Carl Cooper's parents, uh, his mother Margaret and his, his stepfather Omar, and they uh, screaming for help. He said, "I need you." Uh, they weren't moving people, they were street people. Uh, drinking, gambling was, was, was pretty much their forte. But they knew that my wife had been in the movement some kind of way. So they reached out to us. She gave me the phone and they told me what happened. So I said, well, I got to get some help. So I got on the phone. I called my two friends, um, Ken Cockrell, because he, that, I think that was his last year of law school with Wayne, and uh, Lonnie Peake. And, Another guy named, named Curtis, I forget Curtis's name now. We go over there, Kenny takes down the whole story, and then we begin to follow up and see what was happening. Uh, the result of that was that the police uh, determined they were going to both kill both Lonnie and I. We went to court, I don't know, 36th District Court, I forget, we went there to witness some of the early uh, deliberations. And when you walk in, at that time, what happened, the entire courtroom was all police. They had every seat filled. And they, so you walk in the front, and imagine some of the guys who had to testify, from the young guys, teenagers, against them, you walk in, just imagine you walking down, and everybody here, from the first one to the last, are nothing but police. You scared these young guys out of their mind. For Lonnie and I, they gave us the signal. Well, you know, we were 24, so we said, hey, to you. <laughs> so, so that, you know, so then it was after that, uh, just talking about policing, they accused uh, both of us of, uh, primarily myself, of killing a man, shooting a man on an open boulevard and setting his home on fire. This never happened, but I got to get back home and I get all these calls that there's, a, you know, police are looking for you, so you're armed, you killed a guy, so and so. Uh, I go to Lonnie and Lonnie around the corner. I lived on Fulton. He lived on Cortland. I say, man, we got to get out of here. So he said, what can we do? What can we do? I said, I, said, I, I played basketball at the police gym. So I knew some of the officers I played ball with. One of the officers whose name I can't mention now because he later became a commander. I called him. I said, hey, man, the police are looking for me. They claim I killed a guy. Uh, you, know, you know me. He said, man, I know you didn't. I said, I said what you say? What you need? I said, I need you to get me out of here. He said, I'll be buying the police car, man. Take any way you want to go. So he came by on Fullerton, th th my address there, 2736 Fullerton, told me to drive in the back of the car. So the reason I, the way I got away that day, he got in the back of a police car. He said, where do you want to go? He said, I want to go to Al Dunmore's house. Al Dunmore at the time was the editor of the Michigan Chronicle and who was, in a sense, like my godfather, you know, the man uh, I, I looked up to. So... I went to Al's house and told Al what the situation was. So we said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to call George Crockett, judge. We're going to call Bob Millender, attorney. 
and we're going to call Bob Tindall, the head of the NAACP, and we're going to call him over here for a meeting. And while they're here, you're going to go in the back room, and you're going to call the police and give them the address where you are, which is what, which is what I did. So the next, soon the, the, the house was surrounded by the police. Many cars, and they came in, and they said, and they shocked Judge Crockett at the door. He said, who are you looking for? He said, we're looking for Dan Aldridge. He said, well, he's, he's right there. I said, well, we, we want him. He said, well, uh, you can have him, uh, but let me see your warrant. He said, what? <laughs> let me see your warrant. He said, we, we, we want to see him. He said, how do you know it's here? You look? Who are you looking for if you don't have a warrant? You have to have a warrant. So they said, okay, we're going to get the warrant. What year was that, you know? They have not been back yet. <laughs> now that was, that was a clear attempt at assassination. They would pick you up like that and you would disappear. Uh, during the Algiers, the Algiers situation, um, Lonnie and I hid the witnesses. That's how we were able to hold the tribunal because the police were looking high and low for the witnesses. I rented a, a flat on uh, Philadelphia in, uh, on Philadelphia near, near Euclid near uh, Grand River and put them there, made sure they had food every day, made sure they had water so you never have to leave the house. Kept somebody on them all the time. The police followed us and trailed us and one morning at about three or four in the morning we were walking down the street going toward the apartment, their, their place and we see four white men in car, in, in suits and ties dressed up. And I said, Lonnie, I think those are police looking for us. He said, man, you know, you always so paranoid. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I was on the track team at Tennessee State. Okay? I was on the fastest team in the world in 1960. I said, I'll see you later. I, I tell the story, Lonnie will tell you the truth. I told him, I hit, they, they pulled out, we heard, we heard them pull, open the door. When they, by the time they pulled the door, Look, I was running. I was running the 440 and 47 flat. When I turned, when I turned the corner, I, the story I tell, remember, is I said that I was so low to the ground, I had to scoop the sand out of my pocket to keep my balance. <laughs> there was no way you could catch me at that time. I mean, I was on the team with Wilma Rudolph, Ralph Boston, all that kind of stuff. So there was nobody in the street gonna catch me, and so we were gone. Um, and after that, and they, and they shot, you know, and for years. I used to wear a, a straw hat, still have it with a hole in the middle. It had ridiculed them when they'd see me, show them where they'd missed. But, so we dealt, so the police were always trying some kind of thing. They had another thing where uh, I was suspected of trying to blow a felt lounge, which is a, on, on um, Oakland Boulevard. The truth is that I did get into a, a fight with Eddie Phelps who owned Phelps Lounge because we had a fundraiser for Smith. And he talking about with James Brown and the little Richard. And he said he said he wasn't gonna pay, <laughs> he wasn't gonna pay us the money that we'd made. Well, you know, that was a no-no. So I'm you know from New York, I don't know anything about it, but I said, let me tell you something. If you don't pay this money, I'm gonna drag you business alley. And so he then said, you know. We, what were they going to do? So what happened after that was the people got out of it decided, look, forget that. We're going to blow up Phelps Lounge. So one of the guys there, to me, I thought was a police informant. The reason I knew he was an informant because I had met him earlier today. So I said, hey, man, you moved to Detroit. How, why are you in Detroit? He said, he said I, I, I'm here to work with Dorothy Dewberry. He did not know that Dorothy du Dewberry was my wife's middle name, a maiden name. He didn't know he was talking about, because he says to me, have you seen her lately? So I said, yeah, I saw her this morning. I mean, <laughs> he doesn't know that I'm her husband. So I knew then he was not who he claimed to be. The guys got weapons, they got dynamite and stuff, and they went to, I assume, the, the little Phelps Lounge, and they went out onto the boulevard, and the boulevard was just blank, just blank. And they took them all down. It was on television. They charged them. And when they first 
got in the, uh, what to, to, they wanted to find out where I was. And when I wasn't there, when they had the arraignment, the case was dismissed. And it was one thing, and if you look now, it was something that never happened. I know the folk who got arrested, all that, but it never happened. So that was the kind of thing that <coughs> the police did. Um, and that's my experience with police. The police in Detroit, I'm convinced they killed Clarence Fuller, a chocolate fuller who was with the Republic of New Africa. Um, and so um, police uh, beat up people, uh, they shot people, they kidnapped people. And that, that was a regular uh, modus operandi. There was no one to stop it, not the prosecutor, not any judges. Um, and so that's my experience with you know, with police in Detroit. Not to mention, one of the jobs I had later on, <coughs> I was training the police, the black officers, to pass the sergeant's exam, because I knew how to take exams. So I was trained, I was, a lot of the guys I had good contact with, because a lot of these guys in Detroit owed their promotions to me, because I'm the one who trained them to pass the sergeant's exam because I ran into them at Wayne County Community College when I taught there part-time, and they discovered that I knew how to uh, take tests. They could train people on, on taking tests. And so what happened later on, these relationships became real because when we got in trouble in the movement, I could very often call on one of these guys for help and support. Um. We'll have time for questions. That's not the last we're going to hear from Dan, but uh, Elliot. Peter, thank you. Uh, I started practicing law in the city in January of 1967, uh, five months before the July riots. I want to first discuss the demographics of the city so you can have some feel of why there was such tension between the black community and the police. In 1967, 68, million, four, million, five population of the city. The city at that time elected Roman Gribbs mayor. He was the last white mayor before Coleman Young. He ran against Richard Austin, a black man, and Roman Gribbs won by a narrow margin. The city was approximately approach, was approaching 50% black. But with a city with that demographic, we had a police department that was still 70, 80% white. They were treated like they were an occupying army, particularly in the black community. And most of these police officers, they were not born and raised in Detroit. A lot of them came up from the South. So there was much tension between the Detroit Police Department and the community. When the riots took place in July of 1967, and they arrested 10,000 people within a week, I had just started, that was a a real eye-opener for a young man. I was 24, 25 years old at the time uh, when the riots started over on 12th uh, and all the arrests took place. And as a lawyer at that time, the courts were open 24 hours a day. Uh, there was a curfew in the city. I had a pass as a lawyer to, to go to court any time during that period. And... Uh, they started at that time putting $10,000 bonds on everyone just to keep people off the street. They gave Judge Crockett a bit of a problem at that period of time because <coughs> the bond on everybody was more a confiscatory instrument to keep people off the street rather than to give them a bond they could make and go back home. They were trying to get all the so-called troublemakers into, in, into the, not only the jails downtown at headquarters, but they were housing people on Belle Isle. They had run out of uh, spaces, uh, space for people.
to be incarcerated. In buses. And they, they were all over. Uh, <coughs> they were charging probably 90% of the people with minor crimes, entering without breaking. Most of the stores and the, uh, um, and the institutions up and down 12th, Linwood, and all over the city where the riots had taken place, were, uh, windows were broken, the doors were open, so they couldn't prove that people had broken into these places. So they came up with, this, with, with, this, uh, with the felony statute that was on the books of entering without breaking. So most of the, uh, most of the youngsters were charged with that. During, it was during that week then when the, all, uh, when the Algiers Motel incident right. took place and uh, where the young men were shot at the, at the motel, which, by the way, was, was run by uh, a client of my partner at the time, McEwen Pie and uh, Sam Gant. Another, I mean, see, the, 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 the ingredient that really incensed the white police officers at the Algiers Motel, since there were two white girls from out of town who had run away from home, and they were in this motel room with five, six black guys. And when the police officer saw that, it was like gasoline, right, on fire. This, in 1967, was absolutely uh, un... They could not deal with it. And as a result, as a result you know, these, the white police officers who went on trial were never convicted. They had a change of venue. They left. The, the case was not tried here in Detroit. It was tried in a Mason, Mason Michigan. Michigan. Mason, Michigan. And, uh, and, and, of course, they weren't convicted. I became involved with, uh, now, with the Republic of New Africa when everyone was arrested. See, that, that was a big problem. When you arrest 142 people, you know, babies, women, and you have no idea what they are guilty of, other than being in a certain location. And Crockett did the right thing. If you were not involved in illegal conduct or something that was not proper, you cannot charge anyone with a crime. But yet, the prosecutor and the police department wanted all 142 of those people Hell, that's similar, by the way, Peter, to a case that happened when Clarence Darrell tried a case here back in the in, in 20s with uh, Ossian Sweet. Ossian Sweet, this is a case way back when neighborhoods were very segregated and black people were a, were a no-no moving into a white neighborhood. And when Dr. Sweet, Dr. Sweet, medical doctor, moved into a east side house in here in Detroit back in my timing and 20s, 30s, 25. 25. Street. In fact, there's a plaque out in front of the house now, still. And somebody talk to me now. That's good. Hey, listen, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do this history together. <laughs> but at any rate, he's protecting his house. They're threatening to come into his house they have rifles, uh, Ossian Sweet's brother, and they fire a shot and they kill a white man. So what do the police come? They come in and arrest all the black people in the house. And that kept all of them in jail for months before Dr. Sweet's wife is bonded out so she, she can go home and at least take care of the family. But that was a practice of the police department. You know, you just arrest everybody. No, regardless of what they're charged with. And you had a cooperating prosecutor's office and a judge that would go along with this crap. So when we became, when we started representing uh, the Black Panther Party uh, back in the early 70s, they were being harassed by the Detroit police because they were selling their newspapers outside of Hudson's department store and all up and down. With, and I got involved with representing them for all of these harassing uh, charges that they had before hostile judges. And, you know, we got to talk about leadership because Peter's also dealt with Crockett. It is very, very difficult to stand for principle when you have a community and, and a society that wants to take you in a different direction. 
So when Crockett was making the decisions that he was making as a judge and had all of that opposition, you know, it takes a difficult man or woman to do what's right in the face of all of the opposition of, of, of a community that will not totally agree with you. So when, well, when I was in the midst of representing the Black Panther Party, we had a police officer. They were on 16th Street. A shot was fired from the house and killed a police officer. So we had 17 black men and women in the house. And this is, and they called me at the time because they knew I was one of the attorneys that represented. My old partner, Dennis Archer, who later became mayor of the city, came along with me. And uh, we went, and the police permitted us to go through police lines to the house because the house was surrounded. They even had a, a small police tank outside. They were going to just tear that house up. We went in the house, and we got 13 of the youngsters out. Three of the Panthers decided to stay in and shoot it out with the police. I said, yeah. And of course, while we're in there talking to them, they said, there's no way you can survive this. You've got police surrounded the house, you've got tanks and everything. I said, we're going to shoot it out with the pigs. <laughs> to the credit of the Detroit Police Department, when we left the house, I had the thought in my mind that, oh no, these kids are not going to survive. But to the credit of the Detroit Police Department, they tear gassed the house and flushed the last three guys out and uh, with no harm. Ernie Goodman, Goodman Crockett eating around, pulled him in on the case. He was the lead lawyer. I was the second chair lawyer in that case. And they tried all 16 of the youngsters with murder, with murder. Now, the last three had firearms, and we went through a four or five week trial here in Frank Murphy Hall of Justice, and we got everyone acquitted except the last three, and they only, and the jury only found they were guilty of a felonious assault because they could not identify who fired uh, the fatal shot that killed police officer Smith. This is on Indian Dale, right? No, no, this is the 16th murder. Yeah, now Myrtle is now called Martin Luther King. Well, right. that's old Myrtle Street. But please understand, the Black Panther Party, much like was these, these were not these kids were not criminals. They had a firm belief that the United States system of government was detrimental to the interests of black folks. They were reading Franz Fanon books, Lennon books. Uh, and, and they were trying to figure out how do we change this system, but they wanted to change it in a radical manner. Now, also and competing at that time was the White Panther Party, which was also uh, very much against the structured government, we had, and the Vietnam War was going on all at this period of time. So we had all the, uh, the and the folks were against the war. We had the White Panther Party, we had the Black Panther Party, and. That was a very tense period in the recent history of the United States. And there were those of us who, had, as young lawyers at that time, can the system of the United States survive with all of these protests from not only black groups and white groups and radical groups and the, and, and, and the opposition to the war? So oh, one of the things we did, uh, skipping ahead in, in terms of dealing with the police department, when Roman Gribbs was mayor of the city of Detroit, he had a group called the Stress, Stop the Robberies, Enjoy Safe Streets. He put in that group, the chief of police put the most radical, <coughs> prejudiced, brutal police officers in that unit. And when Coleman Young campaigned for mayor, his one campaign issue was getting rid of stress because they were brutalizing black citizens, arresting them for no reason, and shooting them with no reason. It was just one of those crazy situations where we came up with the term where the police were an occupying army. 
within the uh, city of Detroit as related to the black community. So when Coleman Young becomes mayor, gets rid of stress, and I'm the corporation counsel for the city, so the first thing we have to do is we have to make the police department reflective of the community. We've got to make more sergeants, more lieutenants, more commanders, and more deputy chiefs. They've got to be able to have that empathy, not this occupying army uh, character that we had experienced for so many years. So after uh, Coleman became mayor, my task, along with other lawyers, was to make sure we not only integrated the Detroit Police Department, we were successful in doing that over a period of time, and also the fire department. I mentioned on campus at the law school yesterday that it was much more difficult integrating the fire department. Everywhere in the country, by the way. Yeah, because you know why? They, you live together. Uh, firemen work 48 hours on, which means they have to sleep in the station. So it was a real big problem with black and white men sleeping together. And we had to get over that in order to deal with the integration of the Detroit Fire Department. It was much easier to integrate the police department than the fire department. Plus, being a fireman is not a bad job. I mean, you work 48 on, 48 off, you can have another job, maybe two other jobs. And you can get other firemen to relieve you. If you don't want to be around for a month, you can get other police officers to work your shift. So you can be gone for a month, working on another gig or doing this or that. But we were successful during the uh, years of Coleman Young of integrating the, the police department and the fire department. But I'll tell you this, we now have, we watch the city, and I, and I, and it, 1.4 million people, 1967, it is now about 670, 680,000. We have lost two-thirds of the population of the city of Detroit, all starting in the early 60s. We still have the same land mass, same streets, the same area. So now we're going through this regentrification process where it may take us years to ever reach 1.6, 1.7, 1. When I graduated from high school, it was 1.8. So the loss of population and we watched the city destroy it. I'm, I'm going to finish with this. We had no real watchmen. And I say watchmen, people who were guarding the interest of the city. When I was a youngster, they built Ford Freeway, which went east and west. Then they spent, built the Lodge Freeway, which was going north and south. Then they built I-75, tore up Black Bottom which is another north-south. They on the side like this, and then they did 96. And they got real crazy with 96. They put like five lanes going this way and five lanes, just tore out businesses and houses, which absolutely destroyed the city. Now, and we had no one to tell the state department of transportation no. And there are so many factors occurred to destroy the city that uh, if it comes back, it will be many, many years. I'm watching uh, how downtown is growing in midtown in certain areas. But this has been an evolution of neglect uh, that was not properly cared for. I'm going to stop you up here. Think about your questions, and what I'm going to do is, is kind of stack them, let about three questions come out so we can get more questions out and people respond. Um, but I also want to take privilege uh, and ask each of you uh, kind of who your heroes were at that time, right? And, and you're kind of thinking about role models. Uh, you were both younger then. Uh, but uh, who were your heroes as you're kind of going through that period of, of Detroit? When I was in Detroit, this may sound strange, he has no recollection of it, and he doesn't know it at all. One of my heroes was Elliot Hall, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I went to work for Chrysler. The interesting thing, I was in the Civil Rights Movement SNCC in the South. I got kicked out of school for, for leading a demonstration, also organized, by the way, the first anti-war demonstration at a historically black college, and shut the college down, Tennessee State University. 
I work, that I work with, with Tom, uh, Tom Hayden. And we, uh, we did something that had never been done before. We shut down a historically black college based on the Vietnam War. So I was anti-Vietnam. I got kicked out of school. So I come. So what happened? The school they sent me here. They said, "No, we're kicking him out, but we want him to get a job. We don't want him to come back here." <laughs> so they sent me to Detroit to see Henry Henning, who was a lawyer here. And so I got a job at the Chrysler Corporation. I worked at Mound Road Engine on the third shift. I'll tell you. Uh, Funny story, one of the guys who worked on the, sh the ship before me, who I relieved, was Marvin Gaye. And one of the people said, uh, the worker there said, they were absolutely the two most incredible people they ever had. <laughs> they had me, I was an inspector, and I followed Marvin. The guy said he just got through dealing with Marvin, and then he had to deal with me. He said the two. We talked to Christ, he said the worst experience he said he ever had in life, <laughs> trying to make the two of us do something. He said it was just impossible. I mean, you know, I, I have no idea, but I mean, that's how they talked about it. But one of the things they did <coughs> at that time, they had, um, Christ was selling, um, um, what do you call uh, station wagons that were made in South Africa. And that was a big thing. I went through Chrysler, the plant. And I took out every single sign that said South Africa, tore them up and told them I would never work at any place that sold anything connected with South Africa. This was for them absolutely crazy. Uh, one of the things they did, says a consequence of that, I needed psychological counseling. So he sent me to a, a, a counselor, and I think his name was Don Thomas. He later went on to become the guy who headed the development of um, casino in, in, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And what happened was, he says, you know, um, light-skinned black man with straight hair, I'm, um, you know, I'm of Indian, you said. So I said, you Indian? He said, yeah. I said, man, that's great. He said, well, I said, I'm Indian too. You know, I mean, which is true. My family, you know, was raised on the reservation, the Love Me Reservation in North Carolina. I said, we two Indians, man. We two black and we can talk. He wanted to be white Indian. He didn't want to be black Indian. And when I told him I was part of Indian too, he liked he liked it. had an absolute and total fit. The other thing that happened was he had a vice president named was Wayne Grimm. I walked through the door in front of him. They had never had a black man at Christ, they claim, walk in front of a vice president. You know, you when at that time at Chrysler. Most, many Chrysler people were, were, were FB, former retired FBI agents. Chrysler was a terrible place to work. So black men all walked behind. Black men walked behind white men in Chrysler. You know, and I walked in front of that vice president. It was the biggest deal. And they said, what the problem with you, son? He said, you don't have any constructive activities. He said, he said who's the other, who do you read? I said, Debbie B. Du Bois. That took the whole, took the whole thing out. So I'm saying, but let me get about Elliot. I went to work with Chrysler in 1966. At that time, of oh, 65, or oh, 66, I returned to 66. I was one of the first personal management trainees, and one of the guys I saw who was sharp every day. Now I'm telling you, he was so sharp. You may not remember this, but he used to wear a, a, a knicker suit. Remember with knickers. And I saw this guy come to work one day. He was sharp, man, with his knickers on. I said, who is that? And he said, man, that's Elliot Hall. I said, oh. And that was in 1966. I was working, I was working Chrysler at 341 Massachusetts Avenue. And after that, I began to always admire Elliot for his sartorial splendor. He was always magnificently dressed, no matter what, what the struggle was. No matter what you were doing, uh, Elliot, Elliot was GQ all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but it, did, it didn't stop him from doing it. I remember he worked with the NAACP. So, uh, so I, I admired Elliot Hall. I also admired Al Dunmore. The other person who 
I guess we had a love-hate relationship. I married him sometime. We, you know, these movements, you work together, you fight together, you work together, you fight together. Kenny Copper and I always, we were like, you know, we, we fight on Tuesday, where you going on Wednesday, and fight on Thursday. I came to work for Detroit. Got my job with the city because of Kenny Cochran. What happened, Kenny Cochran and I took the, took the exam, it's called the uh, community, some kind of exam ahead. That time you got to take an exam with the city, for the city, any kind of job. And after the exam, you had the interview. So Kenny and I had scored one, two in the city. Citywide exam, we, we, we made the first school and the second one. I don't remember who, which one was first, which was second. But whatever it was, Kenny's interview was first. <coughs> and Kenny went in that interview and told him white folk off. <laughs> Came back and told me what happened. I'm standing outside because I'm next. And they said, they ain't fired him. They're not hiring him. So my time comes, uh, so I'm like, I mean, I need a job. So, so, so I said, what are you saying? Again? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I didn't quite understand you. Pardon me. Excuse me. And I got hired. And the reason I got hired is because when I saw what Kenny did, and when I saw that didn't work, <laughs> then I said, I'm going to do the opposite of what he did. And I got hired. So we always maintain, you know, that kind of relationship. A lot of guys in the movement, like a lot of movements, you know, we both love each other. And we feel it with each other because we were dealing with difficult, you know, situations. And we were all young. We were all very, very young. I mean, I didn't. I came to Detroit when I was 24 years old. Um, and my buddies were, you know, my, and, and I didn't know anyone in Detroit except the guys in the plant. So I was introduced to everybody by Herb Boyd. Herb Boyd was my buddy. I, we met uh, at the hall over here, whatever it's called. And, I, and Herb turned me on to Tom Binion. I don't know if you know who Tom Binion was. Tom Binion was the lawyer who, who defended the fellow who, uh, who killed Eddie Jefferson. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you know who Eddie Jefferson was, the, the, the jazz singer who got killed at Baker's Keyboard Lounge. Might have been 19, so you know the song, There I Go, There I Go, There I Go. No, you don't know that song. Well, that was a big hit, by the way. Uh, so anyway, he got killed. He got killed there. By, um, by a guy, Tom Benny. And uh, I knew the guy who killed him. And if I, if I'm the one who hired Tom Benny because nobody else would, would take his case because I thought at the time everybody deserved a case. I had no idea he was going to get off for killing that. But he got off because Adam Shakur came and took the case next and then got, got, got him acquitted. I don't, I don't know the details of the situation. But I admired uh, Elliot. I admired Al Dunmore. Um, the other guys were peers. I mean, you know, I mean, I didn't admire uh, Kenny Cockrell. I didn't admire uh, uh, Herb Boyd. I respected them, which is different, because I saw us as peers. So a lot of the guys I admired, uh, um, Tom Binion. We had another guy named Tommy Glover. I was typing in jazz musicians. Uh, um, Kenny Cox, uh, a guy named Spangler, Bud Spangler, who, who was on the, on the radio here. So I admire the jazz guys here and the musicians here. Uh, but, but for us at that time, I think we were, we were generation locked. And, and we didn't so much admire people who were near up here. Um, Milton Henry and I were close friends. Um, and I, I, Milton Henry was probably the most brilliant person I, and the most skilled person I think I ever met in my life. Milton Henry could do anything. I mean, could do anything, could build anything, could write anything. Milton Henry was, was incredible. Um, and the only thing we ever disagreed about was the Republic of New Africa. But, I mean, but beyond that, Milton Henry was an absolute and total genius. So there are lots of guys around here but, who I respected. But that was different, uh, 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 you know, than admired. Uh, I also, I, I admired and respected Dr. Reginald Wilson, who was president of Wayne County Community College at the time. Uh, Maury, uh, what's Maury's name? You know, was one of the first presidents of Wayne County Community College. Yeah. Murray, uh, Mur Murray Jackson. Murray, yeah, Murray. Yeah, yeah. I, I admired Murray Jackson. And there was a guy who worked here in, uh, with one, the Upward Bound program I think his last name was Brown. 
uh, Owen, but I forget his name. He's the guy who, re who recruited Wendell Anthony out of high school at Central High and things like that. So there were lots of guys like that uh, that I think, you know, I admired. But for me, it was difficult to look up to certain guys never because see, I was not from Detroit. I'm from New York. So I didn't have that sense of history to even know who who people were. I mean, I didn't really didn't know who, who they were. Um, uh, some of the people that other people respected, I, like I, I, would, I would get into it with like Jimmy Del Rio, you know, um, and guys like that, because I didn't have a sense of what they meant to the, to the city. I just knew what our relationship ship was then. Uh, so, so it's hard to say, um, but you know, but I also admired Elliot when he went and for a time I think had the NAACP because my thing, uh, we all saw Elliot as a progressive. You know what I mean? No matter how he was driven, well, he was a progressive. We knew him, we trusted him, respected him, and be honest with you, I did not respect the NAACP at all. I mean, I'm being honest with you. I had, as being a SNCC, we had some very nasty names for it, and we had different names name for those in AACP. We called it something different. Uh, we use the same letters, but we call it something different. <laughs> but uh, so what I'm saying, uh, and you change. I mean, I, I, I didn't have, we didn't have strong love at the time for Dr. King. You know, because we were, our issue at the time was violence and nonviolence. You know, so something all of us have changed over time. I mean, I, I've come to see Dr. King is, may well be, you know, the greatest American ever. Uh, of course, to me, no one's ever be greater than W.B. Du Bois, but beyond that. Uh, so I'm just saying, you, you change over time. Uh, my, my, how I feel about now is that very different how I feel now. Um, Peter, uh, do you have any clips on Kenny Koppel? Uh, not here, but we have shown some, we can get some for, for later. Well, Peter, he's, he's my archivist, so. Uh, uh, Ken and I were in Wayne, right on campus together. In fact, we took uh, German. We both were liberal arts, so we had to have this language. So we took German grammar and German literature. Uh, there are few people I have met in my life with the brilliance of Kenny Copper. The man's vocabulary and phrasing and advocacy, in my view, I have not experienced. That's why I think if you have something in the archives, it be, would be an absolute great experience to hear him. He could fire up a jury an audience, and had a straight line from his brain to his mouth. He was absolutely one of the best trial lawyers of our time. And he, of course, represented a lot of the radical movements here in the city of Detroit in the early, and was not afraid of calling a judge a hunky dog pig. <laughs> and they were going to arrest it for him until you know, they find the judge finally backed off and everybody backed off because there was going to be a real, because there's a lot of ingredients in that. It was at the time when the Panthers were in the Republic of New Africa. So here we have this white judge, Judge Maher, who, by the way, I knew very well, but still he was part of, uh, of, of the legal system, prosecutors often judges, that were still anti-black in terms of how they dealt with uh, their jobs on the court. Kenny was well respected. One of my heroes, of course, coming in the legal field was Wade McCree, who was on the federal district court, and of course Thurgood Marshall. Uh, the man, the black lawyer, who became a Supreme Court justice and argued Brown versus the Board of Education before the Supreme Court. Um, Thurgood Marshall argued 33 cases before the Supreme Court and won 32 of them. Uh, 
uh, it's always difficult coming up in a system where the system tells you, okay, black folks, the only thing you can do is clean houses, clean bathrooms, clean streets. Thurgood Marshall, who was denied entry to the University of American, Maryland Law School because he was black, then goes to Howard and is able to argue in front of the Supreme Court in a very brilliant way so that all the judges respected him. We have all these instances of the brilliance of black folks that were appearing during uh, times of high segregation. One of the things that I got mad, extremely mad about, only three months ago, was when I went to the theater to see hidden figures. Hidden figures. There's a black woman who is a brilliant mathematician who plotted John Glenn's route in his spaceship, and he would not take the flight until this woman confirmed the flight plans and the math for the path of the flight. And I'm get, I get mad because I've never heard of her. You know, it's a brilliant black woman, and yet she's, that's why the movie was called Hidden Figures. There are just so many folks, not only blacks, but Asians, Hispanics, that are not properly placed in history for the contributions they are made. So Thurgood, you know, uh, was, became a good fit, uh, figure for me because sometimes when he was arguing cases down in North Carolina and Alabama, they, they chased him out of town. He needed police protection to go into a courtroom and argue. I have a buddy in D.C. show you how crazy the system is. His father was a judge in New Orleans. Before he became a judge, he was a lawyer. Passed the Louisiana bar. He had to stand in the back of the courtroom before his case was called. Then, as a black man, when the case, when the judge called his case, he could leave the back of the courtroom and then walk up front. He couldn't sit with the white lawyers. And he had already passed the bar. So, you know, these. So when I was in law school, when I came in 61, I started law school before the 1964 Civil Rights Act and 1965 Voting Rights Act. So that's why Thurgood and guys like Wade McCree were heroes of mine because these were, we effected change through the courts. And that's the only way we could see it. We didn't have enough numbers then to do it with the gun. So that's, you know, that's, that was the, 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 the way we had to deal with it. And, and, and the courts have been good to us. It's been a slow process. Can you imagine Placey versus, Placey versus Ferguson in 1896 saying that uh, black and white folks should be separate but equal? And we stayed that way for 58 years? Gone through lynchings and all the other sorts of degradations before we really begin to turn around and then we get 1954? And, and, and still, the struggle continues. It's a process. But it all happens, a great deal of it happens in the courts. If you talk about people who I respected outside Detroit, I would say was one, my aunt, Dorothy Height. Dorothy. Two, uh, Ella Baker, who helped to found SNCC. And three, um, Ida B. Wells Barnett. I was always uh, more attracted, some kind of way, to um, black female leadership as a consequence of the influence of both my aunt and my mother, who were particularly strong people. Uh, the other person uh, was Malcolm X. Malcolm X, I, I grew up three blocks from Malcolm. We had the same barber, who, by the way, uh, William Tyson, who was waiting to cut Malcolm's head when Malcolm was assassinated. My father and Malcolm uh, argued all the time. My father was a, was, a, uh, was a union organizer who worked for Michael J. Quill, the Transport Workers Union. My father was one of the founders of the Motorman's Manila Association, which was a radical union in New York. Uh, so I would say that uh, for me, it would probably be Ida B. Wells, my Aunt Dorothy, uh, Ella Baker, you know, and Malcolm X. Uh, those are the people, and I was, I sometimes hesitate to say um, 
I dare you to do boys because I thought a do boys was so brilliant to me, I couldn't even conceptualize him. He, just means he seemed like just an impossible person to me. I mean, the person, I, you know, you think about, it used to be when I used to think I was doing something and I was feeling pretty proud of myself, man, I'm really, and I would say, what would do boys be? I said, oh, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just saying. So I'm saying it was, it was that, that, those are the kind of people who I think many of us uh, uh, looked up to. You read, you read Ida B. Wells' story, and you read about uh, all the work that Ella Baker did that we don't know about. And my aunt, my aunt Dorothy organized, look, not only did she organize, but my grandmother was organizing the women's movement in, in Pennsylvania at the turn of the century. So my aunt comes by this stuff. And just one quick story about my aunt. My, my aunt, um, her two best friends were uh, Lena Horn and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And she and Ms. Roosevelt were so tight. When my aunt was vice president of the Harlem YWCA, Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, would drive up to Harlem in her own car, go to the, go to the Harlem YWCA, pick up Aunt Dorothy, and they would go to lunch together. And no one would dare bother either one of them. Now, you could not even imagine something like that again. And the other thing about her is just her sense of strategy. Whenever I would do anything, I would call, uh, what you think about this, what you think about that? Um, and she would say, well, son, do this, do that. Don't, you need to, she would always seem to think about this. Think about it. She wouldn't say, don't do it. See, you need to just think about it. So, I, you know, those are people who, um, some of us live around real people, you know. And Malcolm, I would see him all the time in the, in the neighborhood. And Malcolm was always sharp, and he was always emphasizing discipline. He used to say, if you, if, you, if you don't like messing with the police, don't ever do anything that attracts their attention. He said, do you believe the police are racist? You said, yes. You believe they're killers? Yes. You believe they shoot you down like a dog? You said, yes. He said, then why would you bother them? Stay away from them. He said, unless you're ready to get out with them on their own terms, leave them alone. It's always very clear about how you should handle yourself, the proper deportment, and uh, he's the person that just absolutely my He come in the barber shop and just total, total respect. Two guys came to the barber shop in that neighborhood. He and Louis Armstrong. And the two of them would come in. The barber shop would shut down. And all the other guys there were just total respect. And so, uh, some of us, I think, lived around and with people who you saw, they just weren't people up there somewhere. Uh, you know, they were like, uh, people like Jackie Robinson, you know. My father worked at, my father was somebody, he had to work a double shift, right? And my dad couldn't get off because, you know, you don't have, as a work, you don't, you can't, they say, you working there. He said, I don't want to know you working. He said, I promise to take, take my son to the father and son dinner. Jackie Robinson said, you told my dad, say, look, don't worry about it. You call my dad Big Dan. Don't worry, I'll take him. So he took me to the dinner and the dance instead of my father. That's the kind of what people in the neighborhood did at that time. People who we, who we see as uh, hero figures. A lot of times when you live in that community, they're not hero figures in that sense. They're real people. They're personal people. They're social people. Uh, how's your mother doing? How's your father doing? What you doing in school, boy? Uh, that kind of that that kind of thing. Now, you may see them in the magazines, but they had a life that was not not in the magazine, you know. And so uh, we have to remember some of us are now. Uh, I guess the two of us are old enough. Um, I think I just a little older than I am. The two of us are old enough. I, I'll be seventy-seven on uh, Saturday. Uh, Two of us are old enough to, uh, to, have, to have seen some of these folk for real, you know, and have known them for real, and not just uh, 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 as people to be celebrated. And, that, and I, I think that make, that's, that makes a difference. A lot of history. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to stack some questions. I see a hand back here. Uh, I just want to know what was your uh, 
I, I want to take kind of three questions and let kind of people have a chance to respond. So we got uh, uh, one great question. Uh, Any else want to sort of ask questions and we'll sort of stack them up? Or is everybody wanting to hear the answer to that? Because that's a great question. All right, we'll hear the answer to that. Who wants to well, take first crack? First of all, there's no evidence to me, and I've never seen any, that they were going around trying to kill police. None at all. Mark Bethune lived with me, slept on, on my couch in my living room. I traveled when I traveled by, air, by plane as Mark Bethune. That's because at that time, remember, some of you may remember, um, if you were traveling, you got a special card if you were under a certain age, and you would show the card and you fed be lower. So I traveled as Mark Bethune, um, so I could pay the lower rate. He slept, he slept on my couch. Uh, I knew Hayward Brown. I, I never met, I never met Johnny Boyce, Johnny's sister, Melvin Ray. I never met, I, met, I never actually met Johnny. I certainly met in, in Hayward. And I didn't meet him until after the situation. But I've never heard anybody say anything that they were in any way uh, shooting police. I, I never heard Mark talk about that. Um, no, they were, they, were, they, were, they were busting up heroin drug dealers right. in the city. And the police were protecting the drug dealers. And that's how they ended up having the shootout. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, what, that's what actually happened. Yeah. And huh? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. That's how I knew it. I didn't know anything about them ever trying to intensely uh, go after police. They were trying to deal with drug dealers, and they were doing that in in some consultation with my good friend, uh, Rap Brown. Uh, and Rap Brown and I were part of what we now say is a secret group, private group, a clandestine group that considered that had Rap Brown, myself, and uh, Felipe Luciano. Felipe Luciano was a poet with one of the founders of the Young Lords. He was also one of the singers of the, what, the Last Poets. Felipe and I grew up together in Harlem. Felipe and I used to have an apartment together on 124th Street and uh, uh, Lenox Avenue. So I introduced them together. We were also trying to connect black community with the Latino community and the Puerto Rican community. So there was never any discussion. I mean, I never knew anybody that I worked with in the movement that ever wanted to kill police. I've never, now there were guys who were trying to deal with drug dealers. And in one of the incidents that I know that people that were involved in, I don't live in Illinois, they were after a, a drug dealer who, who they found out about because some, of the, some people he had held hostage had escaped. But they were not in any way, and none of the people that in the movement ever dealt with were trying, which were trying to uh, shoot police officers. We, we were, in, in general, not hostile to police. Not to be by the we were hostile to police misconduct. But many of us were friends with police. A lot of my good friends were Detroit police officers. I helped train Detroit police officers by teaching them how to pass the test. I knew a lot of these guys, a lot of we, 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 I could get away with some stuff because I had off the call saying, hey man, what's the deal on this? How, what's happening with this? So um, it's a complicated situation in the community. Yes, we were anti-police police, but at the same time, we had many friends who were police. One of my friends was Frank, Frank Blunt. Frank Blunt was the chief of police. Three people, uh, three white men got killed down on um, Ellery Street. And it was a massive manhunt for them. Frank, Frank said, Dan, I need your help. I said, what do you need? He said, the mafia, the mafia front place. He said, I need you to, to see what you can do. I contacted, because uh, the movement, we had all kinds of contacts. The guys who were involved in this situation, uh, they um, said what they wanted to do was to turn themselves in and to surrender, but they wanted to guarantee that they did not get hurt. I worked out with three of the guys I played basketball with, with Frank, and we got these guys uh, to surrender, which is what they wanted to do, their choice. And, uh, and to this day, 
I'm in communication with these when he's together, going to visit him. We talk, we talk on weekly. He's now he's doing 44 years at the Muskegon Correctional Facility. He's still a friend of mine. I've known him since he was 21 years old. He's now, whatever, 63 years old. And we are still in contact with each other um, because they did something very, very stupid when they were very, very young. So, no, uh, I don't think the movement, at least the part I was connected with, was ever into anything that was um, gangsterish, thuggish, none of that. We, we, all, we wanted to improve the community. We were not into any kind of gangsterism or thuggery in the life. Now, there were people who were, but the guys I worked with were not. Uh, and I just wanted, one of the great things that, that this is, there's so much community expertise in this room, and Professor Melba Boyd is, is here and, and sharing her thoughts, and the questions are coming out. Uh, really, I think, a unique learning environment where you're learning firsthand from the people who are uh, actually making the history and observing the history. So I think that's uh, really wonderful to have that dialogue. I saw David uh, uh, with your hand up, uh, one of our other experts. That was Kenny. Kenny Cockrell. Uh, I never represented Hayward. Kenny Cockrell did. Yeah, but you stood up with Hayward after he was arrested and they took him to the police station. And you and Dennis stood up. Went yeah, to the police yeah, but it was a very brief. Yeah, yeah. but it was important. Yeah. It was very important because yeah. you stood up with him when they were in that beating him happening. That's right. Yeah. We so did that, but I, we never actually yeah. represented him in court during the process of a whole entire case. But we appeared for him with, uh, as I recall, and Melba, your memory is better than mine. <laughs> I've been with this business 53 years now. <laughs> right. Just a, a little context. You can see how important the policing issues were for the politics of the time. Right? I mean, this, this was the absorbing story. This was the saga. Um, and uh, it led to the uh, election of Coleman Young. I mean, the, as, as, as Elliot was saying, the issue major issue he was running on was uh, police brutality, right, and the promise to get rid of stress. Uh, and, and not to put it in, in any kind of hyperbole, uh, stress was really just open season on black people, right? And it was state-sanctioned violence uh, and out there killing uh, at a time where there were a lot of legitimate criminal issues like drugs, right? And so uh, the context was uh, the police aren't doing their job in terms of taking care of, of issues that affected the black community, right, including drugs and others. Uh, and you have that phenomenon today. We talk about over-policing and under-policing, right? There are certain parts of the aspects of people being over-policed just by who you are or where you're going, where there's all sorts of other legitimate issues where you would think the police would be playing a role within a community where you're being under-policed, right? The major drug dealer in Detroit with, with, with a police officer. <laughs> Marzette. Yeah. Uh, ran the entire, with the, with the major narcotics guy in Detroit. I see he was running out of the barbershop on uh, Chicago and Dexter. Look, so the police were heavily engaged. The, the police at the 10th precinct. They just got a Yeah. Yep. The 10th precinct. At the, at the 5th precinct, you know, the police were heavily involved in, in the drug trafficking and in protecting drug traffickers. Yeah. There was no, I mean, any, no one around, all of us knew that. So when you were dealing with drug issues like Ebo and Johnny and the word, you had to be very careful. That's why I told Ebo. I said, Ebo, I said, Mark, I call him Ebo. I said, Ebo, look, the problem you've got is you fighting people on both sides. So it's not like you fighting, you know, the drug dealers and the police. These police are working for the drug dealers. The money was so big. And I talked to one of the guys, the officers, who was um, key in the, uh, the drug trafficking at Tink Precinct. And I said, man, man, how'd you get hooked up in this kind of thing? He told me something then. He said, let me tell you something, man. He said, I went to some of these places. He said, I never saw that much in my life. He said, what happened, man? I went in looking for a hot dog and stumbled upon a roast beef sandwich. <laughs> That's how he described coming in all, 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 all this kind of money, millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, got it, a drug dealer, 
had drugs in uh, 9,000 Jefferson, Jeffersonian. You go in there and look, it has a chest of drawers, right? Every drawer is filled with money. Chest of drawers. Uh, you couldn't do that kind of stuff unless you would, the police would control. So you had, um, you had the police heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. And so if you were in the movement trying to do something about some of this, you, would, you were stuck. You were stuck between two people, both who were far more armed than you did. One who had authority and one who, one who had technical authority and another one who had street authority. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of bind people. The funny thing is about that, I got in, into a thing with the guy who's the, uh, the commander of the, of the 7th Precinct. I forget his name. I did not know he was a police officer. He was in plain clothes. And he come up trying to bust up, you know, one of our meetings. I said, this little short white guy come up and bust up some meeting. So I hit him and <laughs> caught, caught the pistol. And caught the pistol. And when I hit that, I couldn't let him go then. So I had him down on the ground. The funny thing about it, the black officers were there. They were laughing they, because they knew he was a police officer. I didn't know. And they deceived me on top of the commander. And what happened, he was so embarrassed that after that, they said, man, we're sorry. We made a mistake. They never pressed charges, never said anything. We just shook hands. He said, hey, man, you got me that time. And that was it. But I'm just saying, the black officers were just laughing because I didn't know who this guy was. He'd come and break up our meeting. You know, I said, oh, man, no. So I'm just saying. <laughs> So some, some, some interesting kind of things happen, but when you're trapped between the police and drug dealers, there's no way to go. And that's what happened to Ebo. I think Johnny and Haywood, they got caught between a situation in which there was no out. The other thing is, you've got the manipulation by media who were trying to make people out to be some bad people, you know, <coughs> If you listen to me, these are the most dangerous, the most terrible guys uh, in, in the world. You know, not at all. I mean, Haywood was, was, was a tough guy, but I mean, I, I didn't think that Johnny and uh, Evo. Yeah. Did you know who needs to add to the fact that when Coleman ran, he ran against the police chief. Right. And the police chief was the I'll get uh, Craig just a second, and then the key part was then to reform the police department, and very aggressive affirmative action and residency requirements uh, were very key parts to try to say we've got to change the entire structure uh, of this. But uh, Craig, you got a, a question? Then we'll, we'll come down over here. So, yep. Uh, my question, I guess, you know, is people who have experienced and known so many people and seen so many things, looking forward and out over the world, in Detroit especially nowadays, and like what, what people are, are coming into now. Are there, are there things in particular that, that y'all are concerned about and that y'all are optimistic about? Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears, look to the future. Let me tell you what I'm concerned about. <laughs> I'm sitting down. And I'm gonna be very blunt with you, and you may not like it. I came up with Coleman Young. When I was in law school, there were no black officials on the Board of Education, the City Council, uh, the Wayne County Board of Commissioners. In other words, the black folks had no voice in the city, none. You got Bill Patrick on the City Council, 
And then Irma Henderson came along, and we and, and we had one black man named Remus Robinson, Melville, uh, who was on the Detroit Board of very brilliant doctor. We watch the evolution of black participation on a political basis in the city. And then Coleman was elected. Now, Coleman, I, you know, I got a law degree. Coleman Young had a high school education. He was not a, near the top of his class at high school, but he could, they wouldn't give him a scholarship to go to college. So I always describe Coleman Young with a high school education, but a, but a PhD in street smarts. The man was brilliant. And he was surrounded himself with good people. So we watched the evolution of the black political growth in the city. Coleman dies, Dennis takes over, Kwame Kilpatrick comes in, and there is complete breakdown. And we end up with him being tried before Judge Nancy Edmonds and going to jail for 28 years for, uh, for corruption, bribery, kickbacks. Black folks in the city were so upset that they said, we are going back to a white mayor. Hear me now. Someone said there's a similar set of circumstances that occurred in Memphis, but I had never heard of a city of 80 to 85 percent black folks who voted for a white candidate that moved in from Livonia and in the write-in campaign was elected mayor. Now, my friends, a lot of my friends voted. Said, uh, folks said we were tired of the corruption and we wanted to return to some sanity. What I'm concerned about is I, what I see is going on in the city is I see a lot of black or white, what I call white economic power. White economic power. And I, you know, I'm not mad at the Illiches or the Gilberts, but I don't see any real substantial black economic participation in the city. That's what I'm concerned about. And we're still 70 to 80% of the population. But if you look at who's controlling the economic levers, it's not a lot of black folks. So at my age, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm concerned that black folks drop the ball in terms of political power. I mean, there's no way in the world that, you know, that an intelligent, talented black candidate shouldn't be the mayor of a town like this. But, because I came through, I watched our growth. I'm old enough to know the evolution, and I've watched the failure. And I regret it. We're, we're doing some time management. We don't have time for more questions. I apologize, but, but people will be up here to, to have conversations after. I'm going to give you three minutes, all right? Uh, I know, it's tough. Uh, and then I'm going to invite Marion up, and Marion had some announcements or not? Okay, so then uh, three minutes, and then we'll, we'll close it down. But uh, uh, your future views. Well, let me say one of the fundamental mistakes that was made by the movement in which I was a part of, um, is that we were not serious about going for economic power. That we laughed at the notion of electoral power. power. And it was a gross mistake. There's no question in my mind that the League of Revolutionary Black Workers could have taken over Highland Park, could have run Highland Park, could have been a major force. We could have had major progressive force in Detroit running for mayor uh, um, and uh, for city council officers. Uh, to me, Elliot's former law partner, Dennis Archer was a serious mistake. Serious mistake. He undermined this city and cut the throats of his own people and has become very wealthy as a consequence. Um, in, 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 in many significant ways. Kwame Kilpatrick was, wanted to be, desired to be, aimed to be a bandit. That's what he wanted to do. 
He never had any interest in doing anything for people here. We can talk about things like, if you want to. We look at the, those of you who ride down Livernois. Look at that um, concrete pathway down Livernois, right? In order to get someplace, you've got to go two blocks down to turn around and come back around. Why is that there? Because he wanted that there for one of his buddies. And they put that there, even though the community said no, the business community said no, but he said yes. So you, you're talking about the, um, the, cult, the zoo in Detroit. Um, closed down the zoo. Why? Because he said his children didn't like animals. What I'm saying is that we have not been well served. And those of us who are political need to get much more involved in the process. We have a, a city council now that's just too conservative for words, you know, that represent almost nothing. You, can, you can't name a single person on the city council that represents anything significant other than just holding on. So I'm saying at some point, those of us who are political and progressive, we need to get involved in the process. We need to get involved. You look at the national level, you see people like Elizabeth Warren, you see people like uh, Bernie, you see progressive people getting involved in electoral politics. In the United States, if you want power, you want decision, you either got to take it by the gun, which is what the pre current president is doing in a sort of a way, or you have got to get elected. You've got to organize. You've got to go door to door. We've got to begin to work with our people, all kinds of people. And we have an opportunity now that we did not have before. We used to have a uh, uh, whole question of black versus white. This situation is different now. This is a multicultural country. There are all kinds of people who are progressive, who are white, who are black, who are Latino, who are Native American, who are uh, uh, who, uh, LGBTQ, that, that, that now can work together. See the advantage of themselves working together. We have got to learn to work with each other and we've got to trans find a way to transcend the, the artificial barriers that separate us. We know now the artificial barriers. And so for me, that, that to me is where the future, let's, de let's define uh, the issues and let's work together on the issues. Are we gonna have differences? Of course we're gonna have differences, but we can have principal differences and we can have differences that don't scar us and we can have differences that transcend because the truth is, uh, this is our country, all of us. It doesn't belong to white people. It doesn't belong to black people. It doesn't belong to anyone but us. And so we've got to find a way, resolve our differences, to work together, to under, and to come together based on our common humanity, respecting our differences. You know, I mean, I'm very proud of being a black person, but I'm also proud of being a human being. And being black is not all who I am. And black is wonderful for me, but it's not the best of all things. I respect the, the differences in people. So how do we begin to organize around our common humanity? Uh, because now what's happened, the planet is at issue now. It used to be east side, west side. Now, we've got people in power now. they talking about destroying the planet. Uh, so that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Uh, I want to extend my personal thanks for two of my, my heroes who were talking about that. Uh, I think you see the value of having first-person histories, right? You see the people who have lived this experience and can share that. Uh, and you're not seeing this other places. I mean, there's really special things, I think, that are taking place here uh, and enabling conversations and, and learning opportunities that aren't elsewhere. So one more round of applause for, for Elliot Holland, for Dan Aldrich. Um, As I said, this is a journey, right? So we've talked about policing black power. Uh, our next session is going to be policing identities, right? And I think it's going to be a really important session where we're talking about how people's very identity and persona is also something that is pleased at both the mental level of the mind, but also physically. Uh, and we're going to have representations of the trans community. We're going to have representations of people in the Latino community who are being actively patrolled and policed uh, in that capacity. Uh, we're going to have disabled people who are being policed in different ways. But a really kind of interesting challenge to question ourselves about what identity means, how it's constructed, uh, and how that very notion of identity is something that is also subject to policing. 
So thank you very much. Remind you about the chairs, right? If you sort of take your chairs to either side of the room. Uh, the bus leaves. When the bus leaves, I see Craig nodding. And thank you all for coming out and have a safe journey home.